We're starting a brand new series called Next Gen. Would you turn to the person next to you and say Next Gen? Now, I have, we're going to do a three-part series here, and it's gonna, I'm very, very passionate and very specific about what I want to see happen here and what the Lord gave me for us as a church. And that is, in this Next Gen series, I want to see, and I believe it's, well, let's say it like this, the Lord would, would like to ignite all of our hearts for the next generation, as well as empower the older and the younger to fulfill the purposes of God on the planet today, for he has need of a younger generation and an older generation coming together to fulfill the purposes of God. So it's with that that not only do I believe that God wants to inspire us towards love and good works towards each other, but also to tool us to actually raise up some giant killers. Come on, are you with me today? Say yes. yes. And so we've got a key scripture for this entire series. It's taken out of Psalm 71. Would you turn there with me? You can open your Bible app or you can just look on the screen with us. Psalms chapter 71 is our key scripture for the entire series. And as you read it, I want you to make it as though you are saying it to the Lord. The psalmist writes it like this. Oh God, you have taught me from my earliest childhood. Somebody say amen. amen. When I was young, God grabbed a hold to me. He's been teaching me ever since. And I constantly tell others about the wonderful things you do. Now I am, you don't have to say old and gray, uh, but now I am old and gray. Do not abandon me, O oh God. Let me proclaim your power to this new generation, your mighty miracles to all who come after me. God, don't let me just go through my life having a tasted of your goodness and not proclaim it to the next generation. Oh God, the psalmist literally is saying, oh God, there's a new generation coming up and they don't know what I know. They haven't seen what I've seen and they don't understand what I understand. You were good to me ever since I was a child. I've allowed you to teach me, oh God, and you have made my way great. The psalmist is literally bringing out his heart and putting it out before the Lord and he's saying, God, and now that I'm getting a little older, my, my, I don't have the same, you know, uh, uh, you know, jump in my step, Lord God, I, I, don't, I don't have the same vigor that I had when I was a little younger in my 20s and 30s and maybe even my 40s. Lord, now that I'm a little older, don't let me be a bad, don't, don't, don't bring me home yet because there's another generation that needs to hear of your power and your goodness. Would that be your prayer today? Somebody shout yes. yes. And that's the heart of this church. And as the psalmist is bringing that out, it just grabs a hold of my heart as a pastor. And I don't want us to lose the next generation. And friend, we are looking at some tough times coming up. In fact, when you use the term generation, I, for me growing up, I didn't know that we had all these categories. For me, growing up, there were three generations, young, middle-aged, and old. That's all there was. And, uh, and I was always the young guy. Even into my 40s, I was still the young guy. And somehow I got to skip middle age, and I just went from young to old. I don't know how that happened. And I'm just the old guy now all of a sudden. You know, get a little bit of wisdom, and now I'm old. But in the culture that we live in, they have broken down and identified age groups and called them generations. So just for the sake of being able to be on the same page, let me kind of share with you kind of, and I, don't, I wouldn't call this spiritual, but I definitely call it uh, informational and uh, something we need to know. And so, so they've identified these different generations. First off, they, we'll start with those born uh, 1928 to 1945. They've termed uh, you guys the uh, silent generation. If you're in that generation, just keep being silent. You're good. You don't have to say anything. <laughs> And then those of you born from 1965 to 19, uh, excuse me, 1946 to 1964, the baby boomers. We got any baby boomers in the place? Let me hear you shout. Yeah, there you go. You're booming. Keep booming. Let's go. And then the greatest generation of all time that's ever existed uh, are those born 1965 to 1980. Those are the Gen Xers. And uh, let me hear all the Gen Xers in there. Yeah, that's me. And then there's the uh, next one that they identify as millennials, born 1981 to 1996. We got any millennials with us? There you go. There you go. And then uh, those born 1997 to 2012 are considered Gen Z. Any Gen Z still in the room, or did you guys all take off? There you go. No Gen Zs in the room this morning. Oh, there's a couple. Good job. Yeah, represent. Good job. And, uh, and they're like, Mom made me. No. Uh, and then Gen Alpha is what they're calling this brand new, you know, eight years and under, uh, born 2013 to the present. And I don't know, uh, for this series, as you hear me use the term next gen, and it's actually entitled next gen, let, let's put it in perspective for each one of you. The next generation would be whatever's under you. 
And so, but so the next generation for you, silent generation, is everybody. Uh, boomers, you know, you wouldn't consider the silent generation the next generation. You'd consider, you know, Xers and millennials and so forth and all the way down. But for the sake of just presenting truth today and over the series, I want to just, when I use next gen, I'm probably going to be mainly identifying millennials, uh, Gen Z, and alphas. And so just kind of, kind of using that as a platform so you know where I'm going with this whole thing. And it's been my heart as I've watched this last two years my heart has broken over how much, how much demonic attack has come against the younger generation. How much difficulty they are left with to try to deal with. I, being a young couple right now and the, the perversion that is so prevailing. In fact, if we don't do our job in raising up the next generation properly, we will be in deep trouble in the next 20 years. It is the church's job to pass on what God has done to us and for us. What did the psalmist say? Oh God, don't take me away yet. Give me an opportunity to keep sharing those supernatural miracles that you do. To you, since I was a little boy, since I was a kid, you've taught me your ways and I've followed you. And God, you have been good. Let me have another opportunity at this brand new generation that's on the planet to show them the goodness of God so that they won't turn away from you. In fact, we find in Scripture one of these moments, much like I think we find in the United States, where the children of Israel, the people of God, the Jews, had not taught and explained properly to the younger generation coming up how good God had been. They had been out of Egypt. They had been in Egypt as slaves for 400 years, and, uh, and God did a supernatural thing to get them out of that. Many of them died off in the wilderness in their rebellion, and those who survived got to go into their promised land. Joshua led them in the promised land, if you will, as their El Presidente for many years until he died. And we pick up right there in Judges chapter 2 and verse 10, after Joshua dies. In verse 10, it says, and after that, whole generation had been gathered to their fathers. That's just biblical language for it. They all died off. Another generation grew up. Everybody say grew up. Who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They provoked the Lord to anger. If you'll keep reading, actually, what the Bible says, the Lord said, okay then. If you don't want to serve me and you don't, you don't want to love me, then I'll take my hands off of you. And then what happened was the surrounding groups of people began to attack this younger generation and basically enslaved them all over again. All because... They did not know the Lord, nor did they not, and they did not know what he had done in their history, in their family line. Because someone failed them as an older generation. And I want you to know something. If we don't make a turnaround, we live now in a society that is considered post-Christian. And we got young people and the next generation that does not know the God that saved us during economic downturn back in 08. Come on, somebody. They don't know the God who trained us when we were children so we didn't have to go into all the perversion and we didn't have to get into all the drugs and get into all the brokenness. They don't know that God. They've never engaged with him properly. Properly, and they don't know the history of how God has been good to this nation. Come on, somebody. In God we trust and what people have been through and how God has done miracles in their life. And those of us who follow him, how good he's been to us, they don't know it. And I promise you, if something doesn't shift, the same thing that happened in the book of Judges to the children of Israel will happen in this nation. Are you tracking with me? Say yes. And it breaks my heart because I watch this next generation and they are facing some big giants. Some big giants, man. They are facing some big giants. For just example, for sexuality, the average age to be introduced to porn now is nine years old. Nine years old. Listen, at 15 years old, if we found a little dirty magazine out in the woods, we thought Jesus was coming back. I mean, uh, we, there was no World Wide Web that I could pull up my phone and see the most vile acts of perversion known to man. Had no concept of that. These are big giants. Everybody say big giants. In fact, 16% of 18 to 23-year-olds identify themselves as LGBTQ. 16%. Six, think about your generation, those of you that are a little older. How about the silent generation? They, right now, they're turning over in their brain like, what happened? How about some other big giants that they're facing? They're facing this big gender con con controversy. In fact, next-geners, 
48% of them, only 48% of them say that a person's gender is based on the sex that they were born with. Only 48%. That means 52% believe, well, yeah, you know, whatever. You know, yeah, you can be a guy, you can be a girl, you can change it, you can do whatever. Only 48%. Whereas you go back to boomers and ask them what they believe and where they get that belief system from. I think what scares me the most of the big giants that this next generation is facing is humanism. I saw humanism take over during the 80s and into the 90s, but at a whole nother level. Let me give you a couple thoughts. According to the Institute for Jewish and Community Research, a survey of 1,200 college faculty members revealed that 25% of professors at our universities are either atheists or agnostic. 25% who are teaching higher education to our children not only don't believe in God, but actually hate God and believe that he's a fake, are atheists or agnostic. And that, in comparison to only 5% of the entire population of the United States, are atheists or agnostic. So you got 5% of the general population, but you got 25% uh, that believe the totally opposite and, and are teaching that in our universities. Give, along those lines, in addition, only 6%, only 6% of university professors say the Bible is the actual word of God. 94% do not believe the Bible is the actual words of God. Come on, you with me? Say yes. 50% do not like Christians. Do not. 51% say the Bible is an ancient book of fables, legends. That's all it is. Charles Francis Potter the author of Humanism, A New Religion, the guy who put that book out, said it best when he proclaimed it like this. Education is thus a most powerful ally of humanism. And every American public school is a school of humanism. What, uh, what can the theistic Sunday schools meeting an hour once a week and teaching only a fraction of the children do to stem against the tide of a five-day program of humanistic teaching? This is what the next gen is facing. What we let happen has now, I, I remember having the Ten Commandments in school as a kid. I remember even, even teachers who didn't even look like they knew God would pray. I remember having prayer in public school as a kid growing up. And now the, the, the facing of humanism, that big giant giant, and if you don't know what humanism is, humanism is basically identified as the desires, wants, and needs of man take precedence in man's life. I, on the other hand, and you should be as a believer, are a theist, and that is the desires and wants of God take precedence in man's life. And so when you have that reverse, we become demigods and we're God unto ourselves, which has lended itself to the next big giant that I would point out that our younger generation, our next gen is facing, and that is loneliness. Three million adolescents, 12 to 17, had a major depression episode in the past year. There has been an increase in anxiety and depression among high school students since 2012. The, the chart looks like this. At 2012, it just started spiking out of the wazoo. Unbelievable how lonely. And the reason that is is because they've got all the social media pieces, but they don't have good skills to connect like this. And because we have yielded as parents and grandparents to let the internet babysit them, they have found themselves as a broken generation full of loneliness. This next giant scares me even more, and that is the giant of trust. 60% of next gen believe that most people cannot be trusted. Let me stay on this thought process. 73% of them believe that everyone looks out for themselves. So when you do not trust your fellow man, let me tell you what that does for you. That means that you don't have belief that a marriage can actually survive. That means that you don't trust government officials. Everybody looking around like, well. Uh, that means you don't trust leadership or authority or pastors. When you have an issue with trust because of whatever you've been through, whatever you've been trained, whatever you've been taught, whatever has been uh, that, that piece that the enemy's alienated you to say you're the only one who can be trusted. You're the God of yourself. When that humanism takes over, then you have loneliness. Guess what else you have? Then you got trust issues. And if you got trust issues, how can you work with people and have a good life? How can 
can you actually serve God? Because if everyone else will fail you, so will the living God. And so you have these trust issues. So we're now raising the next generation, millennials, young married couples, young single folks, folks in their 30s, folks in their 20s, down into their teens. They have major trust issues. And as a result, when God reaches out to them, they stand at a distance and say, well, you got to prove it to me before I'll trust you. And they'll come into relationship with God. But the moment something negative happens because of their humanistic way of being trained their whole life, the moment something negative happens, they're like, I'm done with God because my sister died and I prayed that she wouldn't. So I'm out. I'm, I'm not in with you anymore because everything in my life applies to how it affects me because I'm a humanist and not a, not a theist. Are you tracking with me? Say yes. And then that has resulted in the next big giant that I'd like to point out. And that is the mental health issues that the next generation are dealing with. 70% of teens across all genders, races, and family income say that anxiety and depression is the major issue facing them and all of their friends. Next week, I'll show you an interview that I did with some of our young adults. And when you hear, just repetitively, ask them a couple questions, every one of them went back to, to mental health issues that they're struggling with. The insecurity, the doubt, the fear, the anxiety, the depression. Friend, I want you to know something. It is time. It is time to knock down the giants. It's time to stand as the people of God and say, not on my watch, not on my watch. But here's the problem. This next generation is the most biblically illiterate generation in the history of the United States. They're biblically illiterate, but they've got more tools and access to more preaching. They know a bunch of one-liners from their favorite preacher, but they don't know the word of God. They're biblically illiterate. Let me give you a couple examples of that. 82% of Americans think God helps those who help themselves is actually a Bible verse. 12% think that Joan of Arc was actually Noah's wife. And 50% of graduating high school students think Sodom and Gomorrah were husband and wife. <laughs> I don't even know what to do with that. I just, it's, it's so fun. You say, well, you're leaning over so that they're not married? Sound like more sound all right. <laughs> it's this reason, and just to, just to go off grid for a moment, it's this reason that we have partnered with Christ for the Nations Bible Institute here in Dallas, Texas. And we will be offering, starting next semester, we'll be offering Bible classes for everyone at Hill City at a super reduced rate. Yeah, online. You're going to get Bible training because there's no way on a Sunday, and some of you guys only come every other week or, you know, once a month. There's no way that I can train you to be biblically literate. And so that you can help your children and your grandchildren if you only show up and hear a 40, 40 minute, 45 minute message. Uh, the kids ministry is always mad at me because I keep going long. But the problem is I'm trying to stuff a lot and a little bit of time into your brain and in your heart because I got to get you knowing the word of God. And if we don't know the word of God in a way that we can stand against all the wiles and tricks of the enemy, what's the next generation coming up look like? There are a lot of big giants and we got to take them down. But I want to give you a little bit of hope today. Is that all right? Say yes. I want you to know that when I read the Holy Scriptures, I find some giant killers. Come on, are you tracking with me? And I want to take you to this moment in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Come on, this famous giant slaying moment. Come on, y'all know little David. And he kills that giant Goliath. And I love this story. It's not just a story. It's not a fable. This happened. There was a young man who loved God with all of his heart, who was out there watching his daddy's sheep. And while he was out there doing the job that nobody else wanted to do, that young man learned God in a fresh new way. And he took his little guitar out there and he just sing to God because no one else cared about him. And he's out there learning God and he's being faithful to what his daddy asked him to do. And in the midst of that, he got attacked by bears and lions and he fought them off. And then there's this moment where his people go against the Philistines and their Philistines are attacking and his people are trying to defend their nation and their country and their land against these warring class of Philistines. And so his dad sends him on a, on a, on a delivery. He, he becomes Grubhub that day. And he has to go show up and he has to go bring his brothers who are in the military. He's got to bring them sandwiches from home. And as he shows up, he hears this giant Goliath. The Bible says that he stood almost 10 foot tall. I want you to think about a basketball goal. His head is up there by that rim. Said that literally his sword, his spearhead... Was, was somewhere around 20 pounds, the tip of his spear. He's a man's man. He's a giant of giants. He's a freak of nature. He is a supernatural being. And he's standing out in front of the children of Israel with his people behind him, and he's yelling out and cursing the God of Israel. 
as David, this scholars believe he was somewhere between 14 and 16 years old. Everybody say next gen. Next gen. Say it again. Say next gen. Next gen. That's why it's shame on you to treat kids like, like kids. They, should, they are warriors is who they are. And so he stands out there and he, as he's walking up, he's hearing this giant curse the God of heaven and earth. The God that David serves. The God that has been with him since he was a little boy. And when he hears it, something inside of him goes crazy and said, no, 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 no. And he starts asking, who's going to go beat him? Who's going to go kill this sucker? And everybody's, all these professional soldiers who've been trained in Croft McGraw. They're Israeli. They've been trained in Croft McGraw since they were young. They got professional training on how to use their weaponry. They are the baddest of the baddest, and they are all standing there frozen in their shoes because there's a man so much greater than anything they've ever seen. He's a hero of heroes. He's a demigod. He's Hercules, if you will, and they're all frozen in fear, and it takes a 14, 15-year-old boy to say, no, 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 you're not going to curse my God. It takes a 14, 15-year-old to say, you know what? Not on my watch. Not on my watch. I don't care how big you are. You are not going to curse the God of heaven and earth, and so he goes to King Saul and he says listen let me add him and let's pick up there if you will in verse 32 of 1 Samuel chapter 17 are you still with me say yes all right David said to Saul let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine your servant will go and fight him so you got a 15 year old going y'all don't need to be scared I'll go do it I got this come on somebody Verse 33, Saul replied, you are not, everybody say not, you are not able to go against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy. And he has been fighting, he has been a fighting man from his youth. Continuing on, verse 34, but David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, verse 35, I went after it. I struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defiled the armies of the living God. If you'll keep reading, the crazy thing that happens is this young man is so full of Jesus. He's so full of the power of the living God that the dude, the king, says, okay, well, we'll let you do it. I want you to think about this. This giant has come out every day and said, send your best warrior. He and I will have an umano umano. We will fight it out. And whoever wins, that will be the reigning group. And everyone else from the other side will come and submit and be slaves to whichever group wins. You don't have to have a bunch of people killed. We'll just have one person die today. And then you guys, whoever dies, if I die, we become your slaves. If your man dies, then you become our slaves. And the king's been hearing this day after day. And no one will go fighting. And all of a sudden, a 14-year-old go, or 15-year-old says, I'll do it. And the king goes, okay. I want you to think about that. He has now put the entire nation in the hands of a 15-year-old who can't even fit in the armor that Saul has. And he says, no, no, don't worry about it. I got a plan. And he goes and gets him five smooth stones. Come on, somebody. And he gets his little sling. Foom, foom, foom. And he stands out there, and as Goliath begins to curse him, what the blank and blank, you have sinned this. You want to, is this the best you, are you kidding me? And as he begins to curse the God of heaven and earth, David says, you come to me with a sword and a spear, but I come to you. Not in my own strength. I'm not going to be able to defeat depression by myself. I, I can't knock down humanism all by myself. I don't have the ability or the strength. I'm 15 years old. But what you made a mistake in? is that I'm not fighting by myself. I am coming to you in the name of the Almighty, the living God who moves through me and moves for me. And today I will take your head off and hit him with that rock. That joker goes, wa-pow, and he don't even hesitate. He runs over, grabs his sword, his own sword, and starts hacking his head off. I don't know if he was unconscious or completely dead. The Bible says that he knocks him down dead, but he starts hacking that head off, and then this 14-year-old grabs his head of this giant and goes, Roar! You know, kind of like the movies. And then all, now all the big brothers and all the fighting men of Israel are like, Yeah! And they take off running and chasing the Philistines. 
The reason why I want to bring this out to you because there's some deep truth in this process of dealing with the giants and the generations coming together and learning a truth about knocking down giants. Listen, if we didn't knock down the giants and the next generation doesn't knock down the giants, what will happen for our children and our children and our children and our children? We had better get about the business of taking down giants. Are you with me today? Say yes. So I want to speak to you that might call yourself a little bit the older generation. You and I have to have a paradigm shift. And I want to help you with it. The first paradigm shift you and I have to have is we've got to stop viewing the next generation by their age and start viewing them by the call of God and the potential of God on their life. Moms and dad, you're messing it up because you're looking at him as a 10-year-old instead of looking at him as God's successor, as God's plan to take down the giants of his generation. You're looking at them as though they're just a 10-year-old and they don't clean their room. But let me tell you something. God can use them to clean up the school system. Start seeing that you've got potential here. That God's plan is at work in this young man and work in this young lady. You're looking at it as a young couple. Say, oh, their marriage isn't going to make it. Friend, let me tell you. Stop viewing them by their age and by the giants that are attacking them. And start viewing them as giant killers. How God made them to be. Are you with me today? Say yes. Saul says, you're just a boy. You're just a boy. I learned years ago in raising my children, I never corrected them. I never corrected them against all the things that were happening in the world. I corrected them based on their calling. So when they got 13 and 14 and 15 years old and they were acting a fool like everyone else around them, I would look at them and say, is this what God made you to be? You're going to bow your knee to that perversion? You're going to let that giant take you down? Is that who you are? I never identified them as their age. I identified them as the man of God and the woman of God. No matter what their age was, they were called by God to kill giants. And then I would challenge them, you're going to let that giant take you. You see all the other kids? Look at him. He's a pervert. He's a pervert. Is that what you're going to be? Are you going to bow your knee like the rest of them? No, dad, I'm not going to. That's a rise up, you little sucker. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let me tell you. And I would tell him, let me tell you what God did for me. Let me tell you, I didn't bow my knee when I was a young person. I went after God with all my heart. He's never failed me. Come on, I went back to what the psalm just said. I, I, I didn't bow my knee. I didn't walk away from God. I had hard times and up times and down times and times where I doubted my faith and I doubted in the living God. But he walked me through every bit of it. If he did it for me, he'll do it for you. You can overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. I taught them. I taught them how to kill giants. Not because of their age, but because they were alive on the planet. And if you don't teach the next generation... To see themselves as giant killers and you just see them as kids or young people, or little young couples, they'll never rise up to what they're called to be. Here's a second pivot that you and I as an older generation has to make. We have to make a paradigm shift in this. And number two, that is we've got to stop valuing the training of this world more than the presence of God. He said, son, you can't do it. You can't do it. That man's been trained since he was a boy on how to kill. He will kill you with his pinky. That man has lived his whole life in the training of this world system. He is a professional on top of professional on top of professional. The man of God, the king, anointed by God to be the first king of Israel, Saul, did not even have faith in his own people and his own God. In fact, he valued valued the things of this world more than he valued the presence of God on this kid. He never even asked him a question. Do you know God? Son, has God spoken to you before? What is this boldness coming? Where is this coming from? He never even asked him of that. He just told him, when I look at him and I look at you, you don't have what he has. You doggone right he doesn't have what, he, what, what, what that guy has. And you and I value too much the training of this world. So you care more about them getting a college degree than knowing Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Something better shift. It better shift. You care more about them having a good job and a nice house than you care about them actually being able to tell you, God spoke to me last night. He and I are best friends. When he spoke to me, I'll tell you something began to stir in my heart, Dad. You won't believe it, Mom. I'm telling you, I found the woman who loves God as much as I love God. And I'm not looking back. We're going for it with all of our hearts, all of our souls, and all of our minds. But what we've done is we've catered to the humanism of our nation. And we've said, this is valuable because everybody else says it's valuable. We said, oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. How many followers do you have? On, online, ooh, 
that's so valuable because the world said it's valuable. Can I tell you something? I don't care how many followers they have. I want to know, do, can they follow the living God? I want to know, does God stand up and applaud every time they wake up out of bed and say, I'm going to go attack the things of this world? Do they know how to pray their way out of a wet paper bag? Can they keep their marriage together based on what the word of God says? Can they even stand up to the wickedness of this world or the, every time they're attacked by it, they just give in and give up and just go the ways of this world? Friend, we've got to stop valuing the things of this world more than we value the presence of the living God. You better raise up your children and your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren to know the God of heaven and earth. What do you value? Because I'll tell you how you know. All I got to do is ask them. All I got to do is ask your 22-year-old. What does mom and dad value? Well, they wanted me to get a good degree. Wow. Before they wanted you to know God. Oh, yeah, they, they brought me to church. Hmm. But they never taught you how to know him. Know him in the intimate times. In the hard times when everyone else is bowing their knee, they didn't teach you how to kill giants, did they? You don't even know how to deal with the depression you're looking at. You don't have any insights on how to overcome the sexual perversion. You have nothing to tell your, your friends about their genderisms and their kids. You don't have a word because you don't know God that way. And it's not because you're bad. It's because you've never seen the power of God. And they're hoping that somehow the youth group will do it for you. Or the young married couples will do it for you. Because they themselves did not know how to teach you and share with you the deep things of God. Can I tell you something? Our young people better learn how to cast out devils. And heal the sick. And raise the dead. Because Mark chapter 16 says, and these signs shall follow those who believe. In my name they'll cast out devils. You know why my children wasn't scared of COVID? Because they read in the scripture that those who follow the Lord, if they drink any deadly poison, it won't even hurt them. So mine didn't live in fear of it. They were cautious. They, didn't, they weren't foolish. But they had a word from the Lord. They knew the Lord their God. And David said, let me tell you something. I know my God. I know him. Older generation, we're going to have to pivot. We're going to have to make a paradigm shift. We've got to stop looking at them as young and kids and by their age. We've got to start calling them out for who they are. They're purposed by God. They're anointed and appointed for such a time as this. We've got to stop giving value to the things of this world and say, oh, you've got to be better than that kid. You've got to make more money than that one. And listen, I don't care how much money they make. I want them to love their wife. I want them to love their children. I want them to know the living God. I want them to be able to fight through the confusion and the depression. Why are our kids depressed? Christian kids are just as depressed. I'll tell you why. Because they don't know God. It says in that generation, not only did they not know God, but they did not know what he had done they did not know what he had done what he can do for those who serve him they didn't know and so that generation went awry and put the entire nation back into slavery back into oppression oh but let me just tell you this for you next generation guys you also need to make a paradigm shift let me give you a couple thoughts on what you need to learn to paradigm shift and that is number one you need to love obeying God more than fighting more than fitting in you need to learn to love God and obey his teachings more than fitting in with the culture around you you better learn to do it I did men and women in this room were young people young adults young couples singles teenagers back in the day and I had to look that thing in the eye and say I would rather love and obey God than follow and fit in with all you jokers I had to draw my line I had to say I'm not going to do it Look what, look what David said. He said, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. My daddy put me out there in the fields to watch after his sheep, and I did it. When all the other young people were going out, getting online, trying to make YouTube videos, I was faithful to what daddy asked me to do. Come on, you're tracking with me? Well, everybody else was trying to see how many followers they could get. And selfifying, I was out there being faithful to what dad asked me to do. I just watched the sheep. It wasn't sexy. It wasn't cool. It wasn't hip. I, you know, I, I got crinkled in my shoes. It didn't matter. I was out there doing what daddy asked me to do. You better learn next gen to simply love obeying his teachings. You know, the Bible says it like this. You are my disciples if you obey my teachings. Not just because you bought the tag and got the t-shirt and you got the merch. No, no, no. If you obey my, you better love. 
and learn to love obeying God. I love to obey God. It has been so, let me speak, listen to me next year. I, I, it has been the joy of my life to obey him because every time I obey him, something supernatural happens in my life. I'll tell you, I have laid, I've given away cars. I've given away my life. I've given away money in obedience to the Lord. And he can't, I can't help. It, the blessings and the supernatural love and favor of God chase me down. My wife loves me. My kids love me. Jesus loves me. What else matters on this planet? When I get to heaven, he's going to be standing there with arms open wide and say, come on, there he is. And all the angels are like, Adam made it. Woohoo! let's go. And I, as I walk the hallways of faith, I'll see my name and my wife's name and my parents' name and my grandparents' name and my, and, and my mother and father. They'll be on that walls of faith. And what else will matter forever and ever and ever in eternity? Listen to me. Next gen, love obeying the living God. Here's the second thing you need to have a paradigm shift, and that is you need to go after the enemies of God's purpose. Let me tell you what David said. He said, and I went after that lion and that bear. I didn't sit by and go, oh, well. He said, I went after it. I struck it, and I rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair and struck it, and I killed it. He, he said, I went after it. I didn't sit idly by. I wasn't trying to just fit in. I, I'd had enough. You're not going to come up here and take one of my dad's sheep. Can you imagine this? Now, he's got a herd, hundreds, probably hundreds and hundreds of sheep, and a bear comes out of the woods, grabs a hold of one of these little lambs, and takes off running with it. And David, at this point, he's probably 12, 13 years old. He says, no, you will not, and he tracks down this sucker. He's running through the woods chasing a bear who is carrying one of the sheep. And he says, and when I caught up with him, I struck him. <laughs> it let go of the sheep, and then it turned on me. And he said, and it went to attack me, and that's when I killed it. I killed a bear. I killed it. Can you imagine what happened in the bear community? Man, you heard about Pookie? No, nah, what happened? Man, old Pookie went up against it. He went and messed with that Hebrew boy over there. Boy, what? What's your Hebrew boy? You know the one that sits out there with his guitar and sings to God? What? Man, Pookie done messed up. Yeah, he ain't nothing but a th throw rug in front of the fireplace now. Old Pookie's gone. Man, look, we better find sheep from somewhere else. I ain't going to mess with that Hebrew boy. It got all around in the bear community. Don't mess with Pookie. I mean, I mean, look what happened to Pookie. If you mess with that David boy, you're going to end up like Pookie. Don't mess with him. Don't mess with David. And then the lions, well, are we the king of the jungle. We can do what we want. All right, well, I'm going to go get me some. And so all of a sudden, Geraldo decided he was going to go get him some. And he showed up, snuck up. David had his back turned, and all of a sudden he jumped out, grabbed him one of them little lambs, got him a big fat little, 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 little fat kid. And grabbed him, started running off with him. And David said, no, you will not. Chased after him, chased him down, hit him in the back of the head. Wop, 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 wop. I mean, you got to be fast to catch a lion. I'm just saying. That sucker turned around on him. He said, I grabbed him. He said, I grabbed him by his hair. Rock, cock, and cracked his neck off. Stabbed him a couple times. Stabbity, stab, stabity, stab. Yeah. Let me tell you what happened in the lion community. That dude over there is crazy. Tell you right now, y'all better not go mess with that kid. That kid's crazy. That kid's crazy. Here's the problem next year. You're so busy trying to fit in that you don't fight anything. And can I help you with something? You will never defeat the giants until you first chase after the bears. And once you get a heart to chase after the bears, that'll get in your system. And then when the next bigger one comes, the lion shows up. He said, I've already killed a bear. You ain't nothing. You ain't nothing. Homosexuality ain't nothing. You ain't taking me down. I've already defeated porn. Let's go. Let's go, homosexual. I got you. And then let me tell you something. And then when you come to that place where the big tragedies happen in your life and the whole world has taught you humanism, it says you give up on God, you said, no, no, bring that giant on because I got something for him. I got something for him. So you've got to learn that there are giants that are after this next generation. And whether you're the older generation or the younger generation or whatever you classify yourself in, there are giants that are killing the land, that are causing slavery into the Christian community, into the believer, or serving and bowing their knee to these giants that are standing out there running their mouth. And friend, it is time for somebody to rise up and say, not on my watch, not on my watch. For the older generation, say, come here, baby boy, let me help you with something. See, instead of asking them, so what you gonna study in college? What 
you need to ask them. Has, have you found a good Christian group to be with while you're there? Because you know you're going to be bombarded with every lie that the enemy can bring against you. I, I appreciate Yolanda and Jamal so much. My little girl was going over to A&M, and they didn't ask her what you're studying. They brought her aside. They pulled her aside and said, baby girl, let me tell you something. There's a church that we used to go to. It's like Hill City. It's multiracial. I, all you got to do is you want me to make a phone call, you'll find you some good Christian friends. So while you're isolated away from Pastor Adam and the past, you little pastor circle at Hill City, all your little friends, and you're out there amongst them giants, if you go over here, there's a church that will embrace you and give you support. My daughter said, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. And she did just what Jamal and just what Yolanda said, and then she showed up at that church and said, I know Jamal, and I know Yolanda. They're like, woo, come on. And they all but put my daughter on staff. They begin to embrace her. They begin to circle her. And she had a couple moments in there those first couple months, like I'm lonely, and, and I don't know, and all the people that are in college are going to the clubs, and, and I could go with them, but I'm trying to serve the Lord. Oh, but friend, because somebody, somebody a little older said, let me tell you about the things of God. You don't have to bow your knee to these giants right here. You don't have to give in to that. Let me help you a little bit. Instead of asking her about all oh, what kind of studying she's going to do, they invested in her well-being. Stop asking them if they're, making, if they're going to make the all-star team and start asking them, have you heard God's voice in a long time? Let, have you, has he spoken to you out of the Holy Scriptures? Do you even know the Bible? Son, let me help you a little bit. Let me show you what God did for me when I was 13. Let me tell you what he did for us when we were just newly married and 25 years old. And I, and I had that old girlfriend start hitting me up on social media. Let me tell you what we did to overcome that giant. Instead of going after them into the things of the world to promote the things of the world, teach them the ways of God. Teach them the goodness of God. Teach them what God can do so they can knock down the giants. Because if they don't kill the giants of their generation, those giants will kill them. This is what we're facing in a way that is unprecedented. In a way that is unprecedented. Only 4% of Americans are actual Christians. But 82% of Americans claim to be Christian. But of that 82%, only 4% believe the Bible is accurate, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through him. So you have people calling themselves Christians who believe there are multiple ways to heaven. You can go through Allah, you can go through Muhammad, Eastern mysticism, there's all good, there's all Christian, right? Only 4% and dwindling because the next generation has not been explained properly and not been shared with properly how good God has been and how he has sustained us when we were young and when we were going through hell, when you were going through that second divorce, how God showed up in your living room and he ministered to you and how God sent people to be beside you when you lost your mama and you were wanting to quit on God, but you said, you know what? I know the God of the Bible. He's known me since I was a little girl and I'll tell you right now, God healed me and do miracles and he did. And if we don't start sharing that and start helping them with that, the giants will take them down. We just